Many have doubts about God, whether he can be trusted. To those, God is hardly a name. It's just an irrelevant, dusty noun. To many believers, God is simple, minimal, distant. That view of God fails to do justice to the multifaceted master of creation who holds the universe in his grasp. The Bible can serve as a prison, taking the white light of our understanding and dividing it into a spectrum of dazzling colors. Just as every hue is contained in white light, all of God's character qualities are revealed through his many and varied names. Shalom, Abba, Adonai, Jehovah, El Shaddai. Each name, each color, offers a unique perspective. While one color may emphasize his power, another shows him as the perfect friend. Another color reveals him to be the father we've always wanted. Another shows a leader to be followed. He shines as the God of provision, the source of wisdom, a safe haven offering unconditional acceptance. Don't settle for a black and white icon. Know that God is colorful, vibrant, and vivid. Get to know the high-definition, technicolor God. Well, today we begin a brand new series called Prism. And for many people, when you think of God, it's like a white light. You know some things about Him? He's God. But the Bible, God reveals Himself with a various amount of names. And the Bible is to serve as a prism, because each one of those names gives us a different color, a different aspect, a different perspective of who He is. And some of us know one aspect of God. He, he's L, is one of His names, the Creator. But God wants to reveal himself through the prism of the Bible. And one of his names is Ab, or Abba, which means Father. And God wants us to see what it would look like, not just for him to be the creator we know and respect, but to be the father we enjoy. And for many of us, that's easy. We had fathers that we loved, we adored. We know what it's like to be loved, to be disciplined in love, to be connected with. We love the relationship we had with our father. Or, as a dad now, we know how we feel toward our kids. And the idea of translating our feelings toward our kids to God's feeling toward us is very easy. But for others of us, it's not. We have sort of a CEO relationship with our dad, you know, Christmas, Easter only. We put in the phone call. We put in the Father's Day call. We don't know how to really enjoy our fathers. And so the idea of enjoying God as a dad, is, it's hard to even know where to start. In fact, there's a movie that came out a couple of years ago that describes a family that's just had a father pass away. And part of them trying to enjoy their memories and bond as a family is trying to reconnect with some funny moments in their dad's life. One of the characters is having trouble. He's having trouble connecting with his dad because he doesn't have any memories of his father that are good. He finds himself disconnected from everyone else, all the color and the laughter going on in the room. Let's see what he's feeling and see how God might want us to wrestle with our relationship with our earthly fathers so we can connect with our Heavenly Father as well. Well, I love the words of that song. It's filled with hope. It's filled with regret. It's a guy saying, Well, I wish I had learned to enjoy my dad. I wish I had taken the time to figure out how to enjoy my father, how to share my hopes, his fears, my dreams. It was when I began to catch the echo of what it meant to be a father in my own child's tears I even more so long to reconnect with my dad. It's interesting. I didn't think about this until I was sitting here listening to the song. One of my first times hearing Mike and the Mechanics Living Years was in high school. My dad was on a radio station or had called in or somebody called in, and ultimately we were able to uh, play volleyball when the national volleyball team came to Peoria, and they had a, a game right beforehand. And because of my dad's connection to this radio station, we got to play right there in the Civic Center, my father and I playing volleyball together. And it began my love for volleyball, and at the end of that game, the radio station that sponsored us handed us a song, and this was one of the songs on that album. It was a connection with my father that stayed with me for 25 years, even more as we continue. This last year, in 2015, I had an opportunity to go to a lot of funerals here at this place. A lot of those funerals I attended, I got to see people come up and really honor and love and talk about how much they enjoyed their dad. 
And sometimes they were people I thought I knew. Folks like Jack Brendamore, who was one of the volunteers here. I've known him for 10, 15 years. And yet you go to a funeral, and a funeral acts as a prism. Because you don't just get to see the volunteer at church. You get to see grandkids come up and talk about their papa. Stories of how grandpa would come in over Christmas, and he would pretend like he was shaving their face with his hands to wake them up. And we'd all laugh through tears at the funeral. A wife would come up and talk about loyalty and dedication and commitment. Every time I go to a funeral, I'm always reminded how multifaceted we all are. And somebody that I thought I knew, by the end of the funeral, through my own tears and through my own joys and laughter, I go, I wish I had known all aspects of this guy or this woman. Well, I didn't know he was such a, had such a great sense of humor. I didn't know he was such a sports person. I didn't realize he was a golfer. I didn't realize he ran for politics 20 years ago. And I'm hoping this journey through our PRISM series can be the same for you. That you don't wait too long to get to know all the different aspects of who God is. And the Bible can act as a prism for you to say, there's aspects of God I know, but there's many aspects I didn't know that about him. And I'd like to know more about him. What are the different colors of what God is like through his many names? Because there is a big, 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 big difference between a creator you respect and a father you enjoy. Nothing wrong with having a creator you respect. That's a good thing. But it's not the only thing. It's not all aspects. And it's not the main aspect of how God reveals himself. So I want to challenge us this morning to dig into that. The difference between having a creator you respect and a father or a dad that you enjoy. I think a place like Cincinnati, you don't come across a lot of people who are angry or bombastic toward God. You more come across folks who respect the idea, God probably made me, he probably wound up the universe, I appreciate my life, I'm not sure he gets involved anymore, I'm not sure about Jesus or the Bible, but I, I still respect God on some level. And yet there's sort of a formalness to it. There's a formalness, in fact... Sometimes in respecting somebody, we treat them professionally. We put on our game face with other people, people we don't know, people we aren't friends with, people we aren't intimate with. We're nice to them, but we don't have an intimate connection with them. And sometimes religion can do that with God. It's a way of keeping God at a distance. God, I respect you. I'll do my part. You do mine. I'll do my part. If I get in trouble, you step in. Otherwise, sort of keep your distance. I respect you, but I don't know how to enjoy you. And God is saying through the Bible that he wants to not just be your creator, but your father. He's longing for more intimacy. He's longing for a deeper connection. He's longing for a deeper friendship. And haven't we all been in relationships where somebody wanted to go deeper and the other person didn't? You know how that feels. It was a boyfriend, girlfriend in college. Maybe it's you're watching it happen with your son or your daughter in high school or college. They have the talk. And whenever they have their relationship talk, one person says, hey, we've been dating for a few months. We've been dating a few years. I'm ready to go to the next level. Where are we headed? Where are we going? I'm fine with it the way it is. And immediately there's tension, right? One person wants to go deeper. The other person's like, no, I'm fine the way it is. And there's tension built in there. The same thing happens with friends. You meet some friends last year, this year, and you think, wow, we really hit it off. We got great personalities. I'd love to hang out more. But they're just never available. This couple is so busy. You can never get your schedules coordinated. You can never connect. And so, though you want to go deeper in your friendship, you just can't ever get the connections right to make it happen. And there's this tension there because they're people you respect and you want to get to know, but you can't figure out how to do it. it. Happens with your adult kids. You spent a lot of years building your career. You're now at a place you've got a little bit more time, a little bit more margin. You're better at your job. You get more done in less time. And now you want to reconnect with your kids, adult kids, or with your grandkids. And you've got a relationship that you respect and they respect. They see you on Easter. They see you on Christmas. You've got that CEO relationship, Christmas, Easter only. You get the phone call for Father's Day or Mother's Day, and you say, hey, I'd like more. Could we vacation together? Could we connect more? And they're like... <laughs> No, I think we're fine. You want to go deeper. You want to have more intimacy. They're respecting you, but in that respect, there's sort of a formal politeness. Let's keep our distance. And you feel it. It happens in marriage. Where one person wants to go to a deeper level. Where's our marriage going? How can we get to the next step? That was like, let's not talk about it. 
And those feelings, whichever one you connect with, in the same way, that's what God's saying to you. I appreciate that you respect me as your creator. I do. But I want to go deeper. And so I want to give you two names in the Bible that God reveals himself as. And I want you to see these two names as a pathway of God calling you from the creator you respect to the dad you enjoy. In hopes that you can begin this year to have a real connection with him, to understand his heart as a father, and realize maybe what it is. It might even be your religiousness that is actually distancing yourself from God because you made the relationship too formal. The first name is El, E-L. God reveals himself throughout the Bible as El, the creator, the one who made us. And there's a great thing about that. The prism of the Bible says he is your creator. He made you. He designed you. And yet, even in the Old Testament, God reveals himself not just as El, the creator, but as a dad. And Jesus will pick up on this and he will emphasize the dad part much more than the creator part. Here's a few passages from the Old Testament. In the time of the Exodus, God says, You shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. I've come here because you've kidnapped and taken hostage my son. This is the original Taken movie. God shows up to the Pharaoh and says, You've got my son and I as his dad am going to beat it out of you until you let my son go. Because I love my son. I am a strong and mighty father. In Deuteronomy, a compassionate side of the father. Where Moses said, is he not your father who, who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? In the book of Isaiah, thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker. There's the creator side. Now here's the father side. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons. Oh, I love to talk about my children. I love to brag on them. I love to be involved in them. I like to know what's going on concerning them and concerning the work of my hands that you command me. And the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. It says, have we not all one father? And that's the word Ab. It's like saying daddy. Don't we all have one daddy? We have one daddy. Has not the creator, El, created us? And here are these two words put side by side. A creator, El, that we respect, and an Ab, a dad we enjoy. Which one do you more relate with? Are you more of the creator you respect? Or the father you enjoy? I can give you a few questions to maybe wrestle with that. How much of your relationship with God is you know of him, but you don't really know him? Even having been a Christian for, I don't know, 39 years, I find myself stumbling back into an overly formal know of him, talk about him, rather than talk to him relationship. So here are three questions to diagnose whether or not the light of God's ab and God's creatorness is flowing through you. or Whether or not you're learning to enjoy him or just respect him. First question is this. When you look at the creator light, when it flows into the heart of the prism of your heart, as you examine the last year or the year to come, are you becoming more distant from God, more distant from people in your life, and overly formal with them? We went to see Star Wars on the opening night, and I heard it was going to be uh, my son Javen, and my wife, and we got a babysitter to come over and watch Quinn because we're going to the 9 o'clock showing. And I heard that Javen's best friend and his girlfriend were going to come. I had actually misheard that. So as he walks in the door, I had not met his girlfriend before, and he walked in with his sister, who I know, but I hadn't seen her in about six months. And she's about a foot taller. And so though I know her, I didn't recognize her. So she walks in the door before we go to Star Wars, and I walk up and I say, Hi, how are you? It's nice to meet you. And immediately I could feel there was an awkwardness. I thought, well, maybe it's because I'm introducing myself to girlfriend and you're being overly formal and you should have backed off. So I'm sort of trying to figure out what I did. Well, hi, how are you? Well, good. I, I know we've met before or, or probably seen each other around. A lot more than that. You could just feel the weirdness in the room. And I'm trying to figure out, what am I done wrong here? There's something, there's something I'm missing. And then about you know an hour into the movie, you're like, so who's sitting next to Tyler? His sister. Oh, oh. 
you could feel I had put a professionallessness, uh, which turned into a distance. The, the, the friendship versus, oh, it's good to see you again. Come on in. Had I recognized who it was. And that's what happens with God many times, is that respect becomes a way to keep God at his distance. Religion is a way to keep things formal, keep things appropriate. God, you don't pry into my life. I won't pry into yours. You st- I'll stay out of trouble. You leave me alone. I'll check some boxes. I'll do some Hail Marys. Do whatever it is. Let's just keep our distance. I respect you. You respect me. But notice is if you have a distant relationship with God, it's often interesting that that overly formalness plays out into other areas. You start finding yourself, or I do, becoming more distant with other people, more formal with other people. My relationship with God reflects those around me. The second question is, am I becoming more judgmental, angry, or proud? This is why many of us gave up on church. Because we got around religious people who said they represented God, and they were some of the angriest, some of the most judgmental, some of the most proud people we've ever met. We said, if they represent God, I don't want to get to know the light that they know. But it's easy to criticize others, and there's plenty of Christians worth criticizing, and I look in the mirror and there's plenty of characteristics to criticize in me. But I want this to be a chance to look at you, for us to look in the mirror. In your spiritual journey, are you becoming more judgmental? More angry, more proud. See, religious people who respect God and his rules but don't enjoy God's heart become very angry. And here's why they become angry. Because like, well, I've got to do these things and God's got this list and there's this list of things I can do and list of things I can't do, but I'm going to do the list. All right, God, I hope you're happy with me. I'm doing the list. I don't like it, but I'm doing it. And they're mad at God. And I've gone through seasons like this. I'm mad, God. I did these things on the list and you're not doing the things on your list. And I'm mad at God because I'm using the list to try and make God do what I want. And that religion makes me more and more angry, more and more resentful, and I get more and more distant from the person that I'm obeying. I'm working so hard, and you're not doing your part. And then you've got your list. And then you've got your list, and you begin to go, you're not doing the list. And you feel better than other people because you're doing the list and they're not. You look down on people, you judge people, and all of a sudden your heart's filled with all this jack and all this garbage. And the whole time you think you're following God, and here's one of the reasons you're so mad at those people that you're judgmental against. You're jealous. They get to do all the things on the list that you don't. So you're mad and resent the list because you don't know the heavenly, you're not trusting the Father's reason for the list. And and you're judging other people, but you're really jealous because they get to do all the fun stuff. And Jesus addresses this very group in the book of John. People who think they're following God, the Father, and have nothing to do with what he's really about. Look what Jesus says. I think it comes in this last question. Am I becoming less loving? Am I becoming less loving? Look how Jesus says it. These things have I spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. He's talking to his disciples about when he leaves, how they're going to handle the world. He says, I want to tell you some things so that you won't stumble out there in the world. They, religious people, will put you out of the synagogues. They won't like you. Because you've learned in three years how to enjoy me, enjoy my presence, and enjoy God. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you, he's talking about religious people, religious people will kill you, and they will think while they're killing you that they're offering God service. Boy, doesn't that sound like it's ripped out of the headlines today? And these things they, religious people, will do to you. Why? Because they've never known my Father. These are people who are priests. These are people who serve in a synagogue. These are very religious people. And yet Jesus says, yeah, but they don't know my Father. Nor me. They respect his rules. They've got their list. But they do not know how to enjoy my heart. And because of that, they're a stranger to God. And when you're a stranger to God, you find yourself doing very strange things. And thinking you're serving God doing it. That's why I think the third question is important. If you get to know the God of the Bible, who's always motivated by love, you find yourself becoming more and more loving. You find a God who's always trying to close the gap between him and others. You find yourself motivated to close the gap and reconcile with others and forgive others. Are you becoming more loving? Or have you just respected God's rules and not enjoyed his heart? 
in his book, The Life You've Always Wanted, John Orbury tells a story about Hank. Hank was a grumpy, cranky old guy who went to their church. And they started doing contemporary music with a rock and roll band. And Hank didn't like it. Hank was the kind of guy who could find an island of complaint in a sea of happiness. He had the ability. He never wanted to encourage people lest their heads got too big. He had a ministry of cranium shrinkage by not encouraging anyone. He didn't like the music. He didn't like how loud the music was. And so everyone who came into church, he would meet them at the door, perfect strangers, visitors to church, and say, you're going to not like our church. The music's too loud. Well, one of the elders and the pastor approached Hank and said, Hank, it's really inappropriate. You need to stop that. Oh, well, Hank didn't like that at all. So I said, Hank, are you happy? Are you ever happy? I'm happy. Hank, could you tell your face? <laughs> Apparently he never did. They got a call at the church. OSHA was going to show up that weekend. OSHA? Yeah, we've had a complaint about the volume level of the music at your church. And they couldn't figure out who did it because it had been several months since this conversation. So this guy shows up and he's like, well, I don't mean to not take this seriously, but this is sort of different for us. We've never had this kind of experience. And the OSHA representative says, hey, don't worry about it. I've been ridiculed all week that I'm coming here to bust a church. <laughs> Yet we've all come across Hanks. Many of us gave up on church because we had a list and we tried the list, and we got resentful, and we weren't becoming more the people we wanted to be. And we still respected God, but we resented the fact that we were missing out on the heart of the whole thing. We saw Hanks, we became Hanks, and we just threw it all out. And I want to propose to you, it's because we had a creator we respected, but we never got to the heart of a father we enjoy. That's why Jesus, over and over, if you ever want to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, take you about an hour or two to read through the whole thing, it's about 40 pages maybe, each one of them. Watch how Jesus talks about his dad. Father this and father that. He's bragging on his dad, talks about his dad's heart, his dad's love, his dad's compassion, how much he and his dad enjoy being together, how much he wants you to know his dad. See, most people think that Jesus shows up in the New Testament and says, oh, man, I know you've read the Old Testament. Sorry about my dad. <sighs> Let me tell you about something new. But the truth is, he's bragging on his dad. My goodness, you've heard caricatures of my dad. You've got one little story from the Old Testament. You don't understand what motivated that. He was trying to rescue his children who were taken hostage. He brags on his dad. He enjoys his dad. And that's the thing about a family, and even a spiritual family. You enjoy each other's traditions. There's little hidden jokes and little hidden memories. And you know how to encourage one another and how to hug each other and how to, how to meet each other where they are. If you come with my family to any movie, we'll watch the trailers. I don't know why they're called trailers. They're not at the end or the beginning, but we'll watch the previews. And then the movie will come up. And it might be Star Wars or Point Break. We love going to movies as a family. But as soon as the title to the movie comes up, you'll hear all of my family, wherever we're sitting, yell out, I heard this based on your story. That's what I heard. And you're like, what in the world is going on? And then we'll be quiet the rest of the movie. Because ever since I was in high school, I went to $3. I only had uh, uh, 3 bucks, so I went to a dollar theater, stayed for a, a 3 movies in a row, and all my friends, each movie that came out in college, it would say, whatever the movie was, based on a true story. We went to the next movie, based on a true story. That became a game, and so now, as soon as the full title, there's all kinds of rules, because there's, you know, there's been some real competition over the years, when the full title of the name of the movie comes up, first person to say, I heard this based on a true story, gets a point, and whoever can quickly respond, that's what I heard, gets a point. So that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Why would you do that? Because if you're in my family, you know something about me. I'm a sanguine. And I love having fun. I love turning everything into a game. And so part of how I've enjoyed my kids, my teenagers, as I've loved every age of my kids, is I love enjoying them. Whether we're skiing, whether we're jet skiing, whether we're tubing, whether we're playing cards. To be in relationship with me, the one thing you'll find out is Dad loves to have fun. He turns everything into a game. Even when we learn a new game, he makes it better. In the same way, when you get to know the heart of God, you find out that what he's ultimately about is to bring life and life more abundant to us. And Jesus says, I want you to be careful. There's religious people who say they're talking about me and they do not know me and they do not in any way represent my father. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to get the light right. I want you to find out who the light is. These things I'm speaking to you, I've spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. I don't want you to stumble by thinking that religion is God. These are two different things. In fact, they're often polar opposites. So I'm speaking plainly to you about the Father, about the Abba, about the Abba. 
So throw out the caricatures, throw out the things you've heard. I want you to hear plainly to get the light right. Because you're going to love hearing what my father's really like. And what I want you to do when you get the light right is I want you to trust my father's light. You see, they're going to put you out of the synagogues. Yes, they're going to, time's coming, it's going to get bad. It's because they have never known my father. Now, as a parent, don't you do this? You want your kids to trust you. You don't want them to just go out to a bunch of rules. You say, listen, guys, as Jesus is saying to his disciples, it's going to be tough out there. There's going to be people who are going to kick you out, they're going to imprison you, they're going to try and kill you. And as parents, we said that to our kids. Life's not fair. Be ready. It's going to get tough. I know I'm preparing you and you think that these, these rules or these responsibilities I'm giving you are too much, but I want you, I'm trying to prepare you because life is going to be tough. I don't want to do this. Yeah, I, I know, I know, I know. None of us do. But please, trust my heart. I, I so care about you. I so love you. I'm trying to prepare you so that you can face a very, very challenging world. We tell our kids things like life's not fair. We tell them caveat emptor, you know, buyer beware. We're trying to prepare them for the difficult world. And we don't want them just to go, here's the list of rules. Got it, dad. Got it. Got it, mom. Got it. We want them to say, you know, I'm trusting that my parents love me and they have a little more experience than I do. And so they're trying to inject that experience through love to help prepare me for what's ahead of me. Isn't that what you want from your kids? And yet, don't you respond to God the same way your kids respond to you? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And it's not that you're not obeying. The real problem is you don't trust your father's heart. It's not the problem that your parent, your kids aren't obeying. That's a problem. But the real issue is they don't trust your heart. They don't trust that your motivation and what you're sharing really is true. You know, my dad one time when I was, I don't know, probably seventh, seventh grade, yeah, probably fourth grade, I had this new BMX bike. Love this thing. Oh, yellow and blue. It was a gorgeous mongoose thing. No, it was BMX. My brother had the mongoose. Beautiful, beautiful bike. So I go up to uh, Hank's, which is this little gas station just up the street from our house, and I need to fill up my tires. But it's in a ho- Before you fill up your tires, Dad, I think I can fill up my tires. Well, I really like to give you some advice. <sighs> Dad, come on. I'm in fourth grade. <laughs> Grab the air compressor, hook it up to my tire. At home, I do this all the time. Dad had the air compressor in our garage. I wait about 30 seconds at home. You're done. Hooked it up to Hank's 18-wheeler air conditioner. I mean, uh, air pump, which has about 10 times the pressure as when we had at home. And my dad knew this because he went to Hank's a lot and I didn't. Hook it up to my bike. We're about a half mile away from home. <laughs> Blew up my tire in like six seconds. And I look at my dad. He's like, tried to tell you and then i did the walk of shame (laughs) all the way home it's not that i didn't obey my dad i didn't trust my dad and what god is saying is i want to i want you to trust me this life is tough and you need to know the father's heart you're going to think when life is tough that god is angry at you and that's not my father's heart you're going to think that 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 God's out for a bunch of rules and he's got things he wants you to do, but he wants you to start with trust. Because when you trust, you obey. But you can obey people you don't trust. The third aspect, Jesus says, if you want to get to enjoy your dad, is I want to give you a chance to go directly to the Father. You don't have to go through anyone anymore. You don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to go through a, a pastor. You don't have to go through anyone. You can talk directly to the Father. Look what he says. He says, I'm about to leave this earth. In that day, when I'm gone... You will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. In other words, you don't have to go through me to pray to the Father. Because of what I'm going to do on the cross, I'm going to give you full access to go directly to the light. You can talk directly to God. And look at how many times he says Father here in this text. And this is his favorite word, Father, Ab, the Ab, the Ab, the Ab. He loves talking about his dad, and he wants you to love getting to know his dad. I'm not going to pray to the Father for you. He's your Father. For the Father Himself loves you. Because you have loved Me. And have believed, trusted, that I came forth from God. And I came forth from the Father, the Ab, and have come into the world. Again, I'm going to leave the world and I'm going to go back to the Father to enjoy My presence with Him, to enjoy My time with Him. So here's Jesus' encouragement to us. 
We've all heard caricatures about God. We've heard the Bible think it says. We've read a book. We've heard an argument from a college professor. I want to encourage you to go directly to the light. Make this the year that you dig into the Bible yourself and say, I want to see the Bible for itself. Not the caricatures, not the smudged lights. Maybe my prism's all dusty because I've got so many bad experiences. I want to wipe it clean, go directly to the source and say, I want to get to know who God says he is. Because Jesus, in his most difficult times, could have used any of the names of God. El Shaddai, Adonai, Jehovah Rapha. But when he is in the garden, under so much stress and duress, that the capillaries in his sweat glands are breaking, and now there is blood sweating out of his pores, he calls out one name. Of all the names he knew of God, he calls out Daddy. He said, Abba, I don't want to go to the cross, Dad. It's not just the physical pain, but Dad, I don't want to be separated from you. Because all my existence, we've been together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This will be the first time we'll be separated, and you'll have to look to me and You'll have to turn away from me as you put the sins of the world upon me. All the shame, all the wrongdoing of past, present, and future. And in that anguish, the most anguishing moment will be that I will be separated from you for the first time in my existence. And I'll say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God will allow himself, Jesus will allow himself to be forsaken by the one he loves and enjoys the most. So that God will never have to forsake you or me. And in this garden prayer, he says, Dad, please take this cup away from me. Please, three times he'll ask. Then he'll say, nevertheless, Dad, I'm going to trust you. That not my will be done, but yours. That you know better. That you know the way. Now this is either the story of the most incredible father who is willing to give the ultimate price to let his son die because of how much you and I are valuable to him. Or this is the most sadistic father who says, sorry, son, you got to go to the cross. Ultimately, there's going to be lots of ways people can get to know me. They can work hard. They can do good works. They can do nice things. There's lots of ways people can get to know me, but I want you to go suffer anyway. Either God's so loved in this moment or God's so sadistic in this moment. You see, if Jesus is not the only way to God then I don't want to know the God that would force his son to die knowing there are lots of other ways. But if there was only one way, and if he was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son, this is such a powerful love. This is such a fatherly love. Who would give up their son for their enemies, their traitors, but a God like this? Dad, God, your dad, wants you to be enraptured with the idea. And God is not the reflection of your earthly father. He's the perfection of your earthly father. He's everything you ever wanted your dad to be. He's all the good things your father did and all the things your your father didn't do. He wants you to be enraptured with the idea of enjoying him, not just respecting him. You know, I was in fifth grade. We had to write a, uh, a little journal entry or whatever, draw a picture and write underneath it, what are you going to be when you grow up? And I remember that I didn't like girls. Girls had cooties still. It was that stage. And I remember drawing an RV. I was going to travel a lot. So I was going to travel around the world in an RV with a moped on the back because I like motorcycles. And I remember drawing that day a child behind the RV. Because I so wanted to be a father. I so loved my relationship with my mom and my dad. I loved the idea of being a parent. I didn't want a wife. I didn't want to be around girls. A man, I wanted to be a dad. There's something my parents did, there's something my father did that so captured my heart about the power of being a father that I wanted to be a dad long before I wanted to be a husband. Thank goodness that caught up too. (laughs) God wants that to capture you, even if you've never felt it before, even if you've never seen it before, the idea that God could be your father that you enjoy, not just a creator you respect. So what if we switch gears? What if instead of the Bible being the prism that shines out the different lights of God's names, what if we become the prism? What if you were enraptured with the idea of getting to know God as your father? 
What if you became the prism? What would it look like as the light of God's fatherhood began to shine out in your life? What would it look like differently as your light began to affect your relationships, as you began to pursue what it means to get to know God? Well, you might get in touch with uh, the idea that you're a prism. Oh. Do you remember the old Pink Floyd album here? What if we became a prism for the light of God's fatherhood to shine through us? How might it affect us? The first thing we need to do is you don't work harder, you get closer. A prism doesn't work harder to produce all the different colors of the rainbow. Prisms don't produce light, they just refract it. If you want to begin to go on this journey, it says, I've got to get closer to the light. I've got to get to know the light so it can shine through me. You're going to find people around Horizon are very, very busy, and yet they take an hour out of their day, out of their week, to go to a men's Bible study or a women's Bible study or, or in the morning to open up the Scriptures and say, God, I want to get to know you. I want to get closer to the light because they know a secret. It's not work harder. It's get closer. When you get closer to the light, the light refracts through you and love and joy, and peace, and wisdom, and self-control. There's new colors in your life because you've gotten closer to the source of life. So this year, don't work harder at obeying. Get closer to trusting. And notice the kind of refraction that comes out of your heart. And when that happens, when you get closer, the next stage, the next color you're going to begin to see is that light begins to light up all your relationships. You begin to say, you know, if my father is so compassionate, so kind, he can discipline with love, he can interact, he can encourage, he can challenge. If, he, if he's doing that to me, maybe I should treat other people the same way. How can I love people, encourage people, affirm people? What would the father light look like for me as a supervisor, as a colleague? How can I encourage the boss that frustrates me so much? What would it be like for me to be a father to my boss? A father to my employees. A father to my colleagues. You know, my daughter went off to college in August. And I had all these goals of things I was going to do. Every week we are going to Skype together and play games. Uh, that didn't work out because of her schedule and mine. I was going to write this big, long, every month, six-page paper just to affirm her and how much I love her and tell her. And I just got overwhelmed with all special needs stuff and chaos in life. When she would call, I'd hear an anxiety and I'd want to lecture and I would think, okay, that doesn't work. That frustrates her. And I'd think about, what does the Father do for me when I'm in trouble? He listens. Instead of six-page papers, I more sent little texts. Honey, I'm thinking of you. I know this is tough. I want you to know I believe in you. And I found instead of my sort of go get them attitude that sometimes is overwhelming, or most of the time is overwhelming, is the quiet little texts that communicate the Father's hearts into the relationships. The Father was shining into my relationships as I was getting to know Him better. Lastly, if you want to get to know anyone, the color that starts to show up in your life is that anyone you want to get to know, there's intimacy. He's no longer the God you respect and keep your distance. You start sharing with God. You talk to Him. There's some R-rated prayers sometimes as you're mad. There's, there's some moments you're just saying, God, I, I need help, Dad. I need help. I need wisdom. So other times you're inviting God into your stresses. You're inviting Him into your challenges. Say, God, I don't know what's going on here, but I need help. Other times it's, God, oh man, that deal was so great. It worked out the way I hoped. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the skills. You get close to the light. It lights up your relationships and you start being more and more transparent with your dad. I want to know your heart. I want to share my heart with you, Father. It begins to change you. It begins to work in you. You're inviting God, not into your life one time years ago for forgiveness of sins. You're inviting him into every moment of every day into your worries, into your fears. You're becoming a prism of His light through you. Four or five years ago, I was playing volleyball with my kids. I had to wrangle. It's hard to get a league that will let adults play with teenagers, so I, I wrangled this league together, and we were playing. And volleyball is something I've always loved with my dad, and I've loved with my kids as, as we still play uh, sand volleyball and others together. But my dad happened to be in town. He was 63 at the time. And I said, hey, Dad, we're, we're missing some people tonight. Do you want to come play volleyball with us? And my mom said, I'd like to play too. I said, well, great. And so my mom and dad both uh, came, and, and that night we played volleyball. And it was my son, my daughter, me, my mom, and my dad. And, boy, we killed them. It was awesome. 
But I, as I was playing, I was just enjoying my dad. I was enjoying my daughter. I was enjoying my, my son. I was enjoying the, this commonality that we, we, we were enjoying each other's presence. But the most powerful moment for me was afterwards. We went out to Graders. And my dad pulled me aside. He said, can I, can I say something to you? I said, sure. He said, thank you so much. I said, for what? He said, invite me to play. Well, I said, well, fine, you did great. He said, you know, I don't get a lot of invites these days to play volleyball. And I didn't realize what a gift I was able to give my mom and dad as they were giving the gift to me, which gave the gift to my kids, that we were enjoying each other. Now, we have lots of fights. We've got as much dysfunction as anybody else. Uh, I'm not pretending we're something we aren't. But this is what it looks like or feels like when you learn to enjoy your father. You invite him into your moments. You find as you invite him in, you're glad he's there and he's glad you're there. And all the love, all the joy goes up in the midst of it. So I want to close this today in prayer and just ask that this will be the year you get closer to the light. That you begin to think about the ramifications of that in your relationship. And you begin to be more and more transparent with a God who wants to know you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. For being more than just a creator, more than just a master, more than just a boss, but being our dad. And I just ask, Father, that you will begin to work in our hearts and our lives, that we would know you. In all these things, Father, we ask that this will be a year of growing closer and experiencing the joy of a greater source flowing through us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here for PRISM Part 1 today. If you came prepared to give, there's some offering boxes on the way out. But we would love to get to know you. The third door on the left is the hearth room. There's some volunteers there. They'd love to say hey and connect with you as well. Thanks again. We'll see you all next week.